Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokish. I'm here with the one and only, the legend, Scott Horton of Antiwar.com, Antiwar Radio, the Libertarian Institute, and the author of Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And I got to hear him talk about this at the Pennsylvania State LP Convention. Very important message, very important book. But today, we want to talk about Syria because what we just saw with this escalation from Trump is, I guess for us, disturbingly predictable. Yeah, uh, afraid so. I mean, he ran for office explaining why not to do what he's doing right now and why Hillary was worse than him, particularly because of this issue of wanting to overthrow the government or attack the government of Syria, which can only benefit a bunch of uh, so-called moderate rebels, but who in fact have been led all along by cannibals and child murderers and head choppers and suicide bombers and madmen. And uh, Obama's support for the jihadists in Syria beginning in 2011 ended up creating the entire Islamic State as blowback, which we just finished last fall having a three-year war, Iraq War III really, to drive ISIS back out of Iraq. And um, so now that part of the war is more or less over but the Americans and their Israeli allies, especially in the Turks, they can't stand the fact that it's the Assad government, Hezbollah, Iran, and Russia that won it. So the Americans are trying to stay and trying to figure out a way to make themselves relevant here. And all they're able to do is to stay embedded with the Syrian Kurds, which just puts us nose to nose with our allies. The Turks, our NATO allies, who have now invaded Syria to crush one city of, in, in Afrin and drive the Syrian Kurds uh, out of there and are now nose to nose with the American-backed Kurds in the city of Manbij. And we could have a war, I mean not probably, but we're in a situation where we're right up against our NATO ally, the Turks over back in the Syrian Kurds just because we hate Iran, which is more powerful now because they came to help Syria destroy the Islamic State that America created to try to weaken all these groups in the first place. And it's now got them in this situation. Now, Scott, you're always so technically correct and well-informed, and you've done all the research, but I gotta say, and I'm gonna say one little thing of criticism here, because I heard you say something that really bothered me in there. You said we. Yeah, I gotta be semantic and pedantic about that because it's not we, it's, it's the American federal government. But I gotta ask this some, Wait, some no, let, me, let me respond to that, because you're right, it's bad. It's, the English language is a very communist, collectivist <laughs> language. It's, and, and I do you know, make that mistake sometimes as shorthand. But that's the real important point, right? Is that the only actual enemies of the American people in the world are Al-Qaeda. But the American government, and the American empire in the Middle East, their enemy is Iran. And so they ally with Al-Qaeda in an act of high treason in order to fight an enemy that's never done anything to us, the American people. So you've done an incredible amount of research, and I know from hearing your talk about Fool's Errand that you are really familiar with all the different dynamics and all the different players in this game. And it just seems like no matter how much you dig, no matter how much research you do, it's just thicker and thicker layers of bullshit and crime. Why is it important for people to know about all of this? Well, they're killing people. I mean, first and foremost, the whole thing is wrong. And it's obviously the, even if you just take your elementary school education and you just believe that foreigners aren't really humans and that freedom and, and the right to live is something that only belongs to Americans and, and that Arabs might as well be Martians to you or ants or something like that, then you still have to care that the empire and the wars that America wages, that the American government wages, are the number one worst thing in our society. It's the worst thing about us, about what we do, about how we consider each other, how we get along with each other. It's the example set, you know, people believe that government is basically like a father. It's an adult to the adults. And, and it sets the, the, the standard that we kill whenever we feel like it, that's it. And people wonder why our society is so violent. Um, you know, it's the famous uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes or whatever said, they're the teacher, right? They're like the stand-in for Jesus, telling people what's right and what's wrong. And so, you know, big surprise that we have people turning on each other like never before, too. 
So there's one never mind the, the, the militarization of the police and just the institution of torture and just blatant lawlessness and unconstitutionality in what's supposed to be a republic in order to enforce this world empire. So there's one question I really want to ask out of personal curiosity, knowing your expertise, when you look at the situation in Syria and with what Trump is doing right now, do you have any fear, uh, a reasonable fear, that it's going to escalate beyond what Trump is doing now? Yes. Uh, Trump, in February, said, we're only in Syria to fight ISIS. And two days later, Rex Tillerson, his Secretary of State, said that's not true. Never mind what he said. We're here to limit Iran and Hezbollah and the Assad government, and we want to see a regime change there still. And in response to that, the Turks invaded and crushed the Kurdish town of Afrin and started moving on Manbij. And Vladimir Putin, of course, seeing an opportunity, like, hey, look, NATO allies want to fight. He, he told the Turks that they asked him permission, and he told them and pulled his air cover back. And this is, you know, Russian airspace controlled area. And he pulled the Russian planes back to let the Turks come on in to attack the Kurds, as the Americans are destined to stab the Syrian Kurds in the back sooner or later. But apparently they would rather do it later and turn them over to the tender mercies of the Turks instead of leaving now and encouraging the Kurds to make a deal with the Assad government, which is what is in the best interest of the Kurds, probably, right? But doesn't serve America's interest of admitting that they lost this war. They backed a bunch of Al-Qaeda guys, they committed a bunch of high treason, and all it did was empower Iran even more than they started. Well, perhaps deliberately so. I mean, I don't think so. I, you know, Jeffrey Goldberg in 2012 said to Barack Obama in the Atlantic magazine, the article is, as president, I don't bluff. They were talking about Iran's nukes. Um, but Jeffrey Goldberg says, hey, if we got rid of Assad, that would help bring Iran down a peg, right? And Obama says, that's right. And he says, can we do more? And he says, well, you don't have the clearance for me to tell you what all we're doing about that, Jeffrey. You know, I could tell you, but I have to kill you, kind of a joke. And so that's been the thing all along. The whole point was to try to weaken Iran. As you know, from Iraq War II, the Iranians were the greatest beneficiaries, other than the Iraqi Shia themselves, their allies, the Iranians, benefited greatly from America getting rid of Saddam Hussein for them. So the Americans saw Assad as basically a consolation prize. We can't start the Iraq war all over again for the Sunnis this time, but maybe we can t get rid of Assad. And we can convince the American people to invade Iran. Right. Because it seems like that's been the, the sort of big prize they're going after. But I look at what's happening in Syria and go, well, at least it's still a scale less. I mean, I, you know me, I'm an optimist. I see, uh, I, I think, I'd like to think of it as a you know, rational optimism, as you know, the trend in violence over human history declines, that the scope of what they're able to get away with in terms of violence gets smaller. Like, they wanted World War II, well, they got the global war on terror. You know, they, they wanted another Vietnam, well, they're, they're getting Syria. And so what, whatever escalation that is, do you, do you do you think that the American people are going to have some responses? Do you think there's going to be some other check on this? Do you think there's going to be something that, that stops what is now uh, a metastasizing escalation of violence? I really don't know. I mean, I think the American people are over it. By and large, it's the American right that supports the wars, the kind of Tea Party populist Trumpian right. Not anymore. I mean, I've seen that falling away from Trump because of this. Right. I mean, that's the thing. They were the George W. Bush base that told everybody like you and me back then, shut up, George Bush knows what he's doing. And George Bush ran on a non-interventionist platform too. Right, and it betrayed him on that. But you know, in South Carolina, this was the real test during the campaign, was Donald Trump in the debate accused George Bush of lying America into Iraq War II and really attacked Iraq War II and with no subtlety or nuance, he's Donald Trump, he was pretty blunt about it. Is South Carolina the most militarized state in the union? These are the guys who fought that war for George W. Bush. And the next day, he got two-thirds of the Republican vote, and the other 16 or 17 guys split the other third. And, and Jeb had tried to bring George Bush Jr. out of retirement to campaign with him and everything. And he got completely stumped. He got one or two percent or something. So, so they I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, does that make you hopeful to think that it, 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 no, no matter what Trump tries to get away with, at least members of Congress who are looking at re-election, at least if Donald Trump is trying to get re-elected, he knows that already with this, he's going to have a real hard time. Like, and, 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 you know, the, the sort of 
predictable challenger Rand Paul being able to come in and say, hey, look, I'm going to be the real non-intervention, and I don't know if you want to believe that, but that there's at least slow change proportionate to the smaller crime. And I mean, I, I look at this and I go, oh, Donald Trump wanted to start a war over 42 people died in, in a hypothetical chemical weapons attack. You got 20 veterans committing suicide every single day in this country. This is totally just out of touch with reality, totally disproportionate. Well, you know, I think that's the important point other than just the American people and the budget and everything else being at the breaking point. You know, Colonel Douglas McGregor, who's a pretty anti-war guy now, um, who's a regular on Fox News. I saw him telling Tucker Carlson back, say, last fall, I guess, that, listen, the Army is basically a broken force. I mean, the Navy and the Air Force have been flying nonstop sorties since 1991. And they're just, they're, it doesn't work. The infantry out there in Afghanistan and the special operations forces in Iraq, whatever, they have no morale. They, have, they don't believe that they need to be there. They, you know, they're, they're basically a spent force. They're, the people who, and you... Emotionally, you, intellectually, they don't have the buy-in, at least. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think you could speak to this better than me, that when you join up the service, you think you're going to protect America from foreign states that might attack us, not go around on patrol harassing human beings in their own damn neighborhoods on the other side of the planet. And then they tell you, hey, you're going to go and you're going to be a hero, and you go to Iraq and you come home and go, not only am I not a hero, nobody gives a damn about me coming home either. One last question about what we're seeing in Syria. Chemical attack, the most recent one, or any of the previous ones that we've seen used as a propaganda excuse to draw the red line. Do you think... Do you think they're real? And if so, who do you think is actually behind them? Well, there have been, you know, some minor chlorine attacks kind of th for years throughout the war. And I think virtually all of those were done by the jihadis attacking the Kurds and that kind of thing. The jihadis sponsored by the U.S. State Department and the CIA? Overall, yeah. Not every single group was on the CIA payroll, but dumping guns and money into their overall movement, it's the same thing. Even in the words of Hillary Clinton, if Zawahiri from Al-Qaeda has endorsed and is supporting the war there, then are we helping Al-Qaeda in Syria? Then, and you know, yes. So yes. Um, now the big ones that got the headlines, the red lines that you're referring to, in 2013, no, it was a hoax perpetrated by Al-Qaeda and the Turks to try to cross the red line. To frame Assad. That's right, to frame Assad in, in, uh, in Ghouta in eastern Damascus in 2013. And then a year ago, what it was, was the Russians bombed a building and they had told the Americans, we're going to bomb this building now. It was a meeting of a bunch of Al-Qaeda guys in Khan Shikun. And they had chemicals and what have you stored in that building that mixed and caused a poisonous fume. And, and so the Al-Qaeda PR team, the White Helmets, basically framed up an issue. And, you know, there's all kinds of discrepancies about it. But, you know, I showed a legitimate rocket scientist pictures of the so-called crater from the chemical weapon, uh, the single rocket that supposedly landed in the street. And, you know, he just laughed and said it was no big deal. And in fact, you know, they may have already been, you know, planning something because according to the OPCW investigation, you had the uh, so-called victims of the gas attack were showing up at hospitals before it even supposedly took place. So... They had, didn't quite have their script together there when they put that one. And then this one, there may well have been a chlorine attack, but I don't have any reason to believe the claims of basically uh, a, a not exactly an al-Qaeda group, but Jaysh al-Islam, which is carbon copies basically, not the same chain of command, but the same thing as an al-Qaeda group. And they're, again, the white helmet PR teams making their claims. And some of the footage is just, it's some kids standing there and they're hosing him down, but... That doesn't impress me. I'm sorry. Like I, you know, and now there'd be a lot more. There'd be a lot more evidence. There'd be a lot more video. Well, and this time, unlike the previous ones, this time the OPCW is going in themselves. It's, it's you know the the actual jihadis were bust out. They surrendered and were bust out to the Idlib province. So that area is now completely under Syrian government control, and they are now letting the OPCW in. And that's the whole thing. Trump did this strike on Friday night. Well, the inspectors were due to arrive on Saturday. So what's the hurry? If you got to bomb somebody over some chemical weapons, let's see some science here. You know, and it may turn out, you know what, I mean, we're talking about a government here. So does it make no sense at all 
for the Syrians to cross this red line right when the end of the war is in sight and the last little Al Qaeda readout in Idlib is under siege and they're virtually on the verge of victory and this is the only possible way to provoke the Americans to coming in overtly against them. Does that, does that mean it's impossible that they would do it? No, right? Like, I guess it's somehow within the realm of possibility that some officer in the Syrian Arab army decided to make this horrible blunder, but it sure doesn't seem very likely to me. And the excuses for war never hold water anyway. So, Scott, any websites you want to plug where people can find out more about you in your book? Sure. Uh, Libertarian Institute, I run that with the great Sheldon Richmond there and uh, Jared LaBelle. Uh, libertarianinstitute.org, antiwar.com, of course, Jason Ditz and Eric Garris and uh, Justin Romano and uh, others there at antiwar.com. And then uh, the book is fooleserin.us for the book. Ron Paul liked it. So, yeah. Ladies audio and gentlemen. Audio book now available. Scott Horn, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, brother. Oh, yeah. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube, and you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.